Hi y'all, in this video I'll be responding to a video Thunderfoot did on the aftermath of the Brexit vote, but before that, a quick message to both sides. Uh, to the Brexiteers, uh, congratulations on your win, and to the Remain camp, I would still like to congratulate you on your being LOSERS! I'm loving the butt hurt you guys have. Speaking of which, so Thunderfoot brings up that the pound fell against the dollar and the stocks crashed. And that uh, if this only takes a year to recover, it'll be whatever amount of money that's lost. Conspicuously missing from these uh, discussions about how far the market fell is the fact that it recovered 50% of its loss within hours. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, stocks now, on London Stock Exchange, I should, say, I should say, their indices, are back to where they were a few weeks ago. The uh, value of the pound against the dollar right now is back where it was in February. So let's think about a couple of months ago, you know, back when the United Kingdom was a poor third world country that didn't have a functioning government, couldn't afford health care, people were starving, they couldn't afford schools and to clothe their people in shoes and dentistry, although that one could be true in the UK, and uh, all these other things. And do you remember back when, back when the United Kingdom a couple months ago was just like destitute? Oh, it wasn't? Okay, thanks. Everyone knows that whenever major decisions in the world happens, it creates a shock to the market. Investors, uh, some, many of them, tend to be uh, conservative, and when, it, look, when there's an outcome that's not expected, they, are, they protect their assets. Now, you attribute this directly to the vote in and of itself, rather than to the uh, expectations that were being uh, prattled out before it, and then when the, the expected outcome is not what happened, that's what spooked them. Uh, it, it shows that there are uncertainty, that, that all the things saying, yeah, it's probably going to be uh, the, the Remain camp that's going to win, and then that reverses, that creates the shock. So what you see is the, the irrational fear, and then cooler heads prevailing as it just comes right back up, uh, and with hours, as I, as I mentioned, back up like uh, half of what it lost. Now, it's interesting, see, uh, Thunderfoot didn't say this, but CNN had an article after it already recovered. At that point, it was back up to 60% of the initial loss. And they, they described uh, the drop as a Black Friday and uh, a big loss and blah, blah, blah. And they described the, 60, the 50 to 60 percent recovery in lo on like the FTSE 100. They described that as market instability. Apparently, if you drop two $20 bills and, and you grab up one really quickly, uh, that's, not, that's not saving half of your assets. That's not uh, rescuing it. That's the, that's the unstable part and uh, the rest of it, we'll just see what happens. Okay. So then uh, Thunderfoot talks about most of the money sent to the EU comes back. Uh, I think William F. Buckley said this, uh, described this best uh, when he was talking about the role of government and what happens to the United States with respect to the federal government. That you, the taxpayer, and the cities, and the counties, and the states, you send your money to Washington where it has an extremely expensive night on the town visiting everybody's pockets, and then whatever doesn't fit in those comes back to visit you your home. You would have been much better just keeping the money and spending it directly so you didn't have to pay the cost of it visiting everybody's pocket. But to that Thunderfoot, your option, your argument is actually no. Uh, send, it, send, it, send as much of it uh, over there, send a lot of it over there, and let it party in everybody's pockets, and whatever they don't use immediately can come back to you in the form of a grant or an aid or whatever. Uh, but, you know, anyway, it's not even... I already talked about the economic issue versus liberty in a different one. So the, uh, you bring up the Scottish, the Sc uh, Scottish independence, and how they're gonna, they're this is probably going to cause them to have a referendum. They've been pushing for another referendum ever since they lost the first one. This is just the latest thing that happened in the world where they go, oh, we'll, we'll latch onto that. That looks good. Oh my God, we can exploit that. Yes, politics. Woo! -hoo! We can lie to people now. Yay! Like every other issue in the world that has happened since the SNP has come into power. It doesn't matter what it is. The Prime Minister's shoes are untied. We need a referendum. Oh my God, a doggy across the street. We need a referendum. We need some independence. We can't have dogs just walking across the street like that and the Prime Minister walk around with this shoe untied. We need freedom. Sorry. But then you made a mistake. You quoted Thomas Jefferson. Your audience is largely Americans. One of my hobbies is collecting misquotes of our founding fathers. So you made a big mistake in, in quoting it to me. And I, I bring this up only because you were making great hay over this and said, well, uh, the quote. A democracy is nothing more than mob rule where 51% of the people take away the rights of the other 49%, after which he said, is it just me or do these numbers look, do these numbers look remarkably uh, familiar? And then he uh, shows the spread on the, uh, the Brexit campaign. Um, you, if you don't believe uh, me when I say that Thomas Jefferson didn't say this, go to the Thomas Jefferson uh, uh, Monticello.org. It's the website for his museum. 
where they have, uh, where they curate all of his works, all of his writings. They have searched all of it. This quote is not there, nor is there anything like it. And the way that you, you could have known this, even if you didn't have my hobby of collecting misattributions to our founding fathers, the way that you could know this is to know something about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, a principal fact about this man is that he wasn't retarded. Uh, this does not talk about democracy. What's described there is something else called oclocracy. Thomas Jefferson is not so mentally enfeebled and stupid to have uh, confused democracy and oclocracy. They're both majoritarian systems, but democracy is a just way of majority rule, whereas oclocracy is mob rule. It is an unjust way to do it. So you are perverting Thomas Jefferson's quest and uh, maintenance and fidelity to liberty and trying and using this mis, mis, this entirely manufactured quote, I didn't he didn't manufacture it, it, it predated his use of it, uh, in support to show the problems that Thomas Jefferson didn't consider to be problems. I'll give you a quote. He actually said, well, he said it in Latin, so I'll translate it. I prefer a bit of uh, uh, dangerous liberty to a bit of peaceful slavery. You seem to prefer a lot of peaceful slavery to any degree of dangerous liberty. Anyone who's in the quest in the liberty uh, grand in the liberty procuring business knows it doesn't come cost free. The price is high. You might lose some money in the short term. We lost a lot of money in the short term when we exerted our will from a foreign power. Nevertheless, you give it you, you take the liberty shit seriously. You work very hard at making it work, and you work very hard at building it. Blah blah blah. And you too, if you follow America's route, can start to emulate the prestige, power, importance and freedom of the American people. We started from naught and have become the world's only standing superpower. All of our rivals have been swept away. For those who think that the UK's best days are behind them, I don't think, I don't think that's necessarily true. Your best days could lie ahead yet, but you have got to work hard for it. And then, uh, you, Thunderfoot, you complain that the PM is usurping democracy because of the three-month delay from the, the vote to when the next Prime Minister is going to come in and it will be his responsibility to invoke Article 50. Um, where I live, uh, in, in the United States generally, but my state in particular, we have an initiative process where we directly, on our own initiative, that's what it's called that, can overrule our, lev our, our uh, legislature. We pass a law and then um, it, it you know, uh, takes effect sometime later. You have the enactment date and then you have the effective date. The effective date, typically, is 90 days from the enactment date or the ratification date. Why is that? Prudence, wisdom, deliberate haste. It isn't dragging your feet and it's not running recklessly into the future. It is measured, it is deliberate, it is responsible. Your complaint about Cameron here is that he as a statesman, that he as the Prime Minister of your country is doing wrong because he's not acting recklessly. This is a years-long project. No one thought that the vote would happen and that David Cameron's, uh, the, the note had been written, and most of his signature had been put on the page invoking it, and they were just waiting for, uh, for the last vote to be cast, or to be counted, when he would dot an I, you know, over David, and be like, it's done! No one thinks that. It's going to be a responsible uh, change. It's going to be a, deliberately, uh, a deliberate change. It's going to proceed at all deliberate speed. And you say nothing at all when you say that Juncker was the one protecting democracy, not David Cameron, because he's saying that we should uh, move towards this, you know, respecting the, the vote of the British people as quickly as possible, which you, you uh, say, and so do I. But as quickly as possible doesn't mean recklessly. It means as quickly as is responsibly possible, as quickly as is reasonably possible. You don't want to cause uh, mischief in, in the economic system any more than you have to, which is what it happens if you were to act recklessly in implementing this without due foresight, without careful reflection. And uh, David Cameron's putting this off until the next prime minister is simply his not cutting out the legs from the, other, the next prime minister to be able to do this responsibly. Once that article is invoked, it is a two-year fixed term time that the, uh, all the negotiations have to be completed. If David Cameron invokes it today, and then the next prime minister doesn't come around until three months from now, instead of having the full two years within which time to be responsible, he, uh, he now has only one year, nine months, to get it all done. So I don't think it's much of a complaint to say that David Cameron is acting like an adult here and saying, I lost, and I'm not going to fuck the next guy who has to implement this. All right, so, and then your Nigel Farage excerpt, where you conveniently, by accident, I'm sure, left out uh, that um, Farage pointed out, don't, don't go associating me with the Leave campaign. Remember, they ostracized me. I went off and I did my own thing. 
like I normally do. Remember Thunderfoot, you used to advocate this, you called it the big tent. And this is exactly how creationists talk when they speak to atheists. They're, oh, you know, um, Hit, uh, Stalin was an atheist and you're an atheist, so you have to account for what Stalin did. Fuck you, no I don't. Neither does Nigel Farage. He didn't make the argument, for those who don't know, it's a news clip where uh, the newscaster asked him about uh, asked him about this 350 million pounds per week that go to the EU and whether or not he could guarantee that all of that money would go into the NHS. And he said, no, I can't. Well, of course he can't. He's not a member of parliament. He can't raise money bills. He doesn't get to go in there and, and be involved in that process. He can't guarantee anything that happens in the House. He's not a member. That's for the members of parliament to sort out. And uh, this wasn't an argument that he made. He did point out that that money could be spent other places, the NHS, schools, uh, you know, other things he pointed out that it could be spent on. And then, and here, here's part of what you left out, he says, but the money used to go there. In the future, it won't be going there, and we can do with it whatever we would like. It could go to the health care. It could go to this. That's up to the parliament and the people. So it's uh, awfully convenient and accidental, I'm quite sure, that you left uh, that part out. This is nothing at all like mining the Eddington concession. Where it, it, I realize it's not exactly that, but it's nothing at all similar to it. Oh, wait, yeah, it is. Y you're, you're trying to say that the, the Leave campaign has reversed itself. No, it hasn't. He wasn't a member of that. Don't make him responsible for what he didn't argue. And uh, remember, I, I, as I mentioned, I remember you used to be a big tent kind of guy where with respect to this issue, people who uh, are also lobbying for it, with whom you disagree on everything else, are, in respect of that issue alone, your allies. And it is stupid to start sharpshooting your allies while also trying to fight your enemy. I think, what was it you said? A house divided against itself cannot stand? And now you're going to use your very motto, your very way of operating a few years ago, which I support, to in, impugn and, uh, his motives and to, in, to impugn the whole process and to indict Nigel Farage as a hypocrite or as being responsible for something that he didn't propose and indeed has said is, was a mistake of the Leave campaign to have done. All right, you guys have a great day.